Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is Richie Schneiderite. we got another packed show here. We're going to talk the Rutgers-Michigan State game from this past weekend. we got a decommit for football in the class of 2023. We're going to talk basketball. Uh, so recap Saturday against UMass Lowell. We'll preview Friday against uh, Temple in uh, Connecticut. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about recruiting because the uh, early signing period is closing in basketball. And we'll sprinkle in a little men's soccer. Um, but first, this podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends on Bet Online. As your continued source for all your sports wagering info, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. It's always the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even golf. You can head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus at your first deposit. Make sure to use the pro- promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. And uh, as always, we're also sponsored by Adam Goldman. Um, Adam Goldman is the franchise coach. There's no other way around it. He, uh, he can basically just set you up and change your career completely, uh, set you up with your own type of franchise, whether that be a, f- a food industry st- type stuff, uh, medical pr- uh, business, or something else. Um, Adam's a Jersey guy through and through, Rutgers alum, Rutgers fan, or Rutgers fan uh, watching Hills native and night report member. So uh, if, if you're interested in switching up your career and trying to do something different than that nine to five, uh, give them a call today, 844-800-3726 or franchisecoach.net. Oof. All right. Now that we got that out of the way, let's first talk about this game uh, in <clears throat> East Lansing last Saturday. So Rutgers went into East Lansing as a nine and a half to 10 point underdog, depending on when you made the bet and depending on what uh, site you used. They ended up losing 27 to 21. Um, there were a lot of positives to take away from this one, but uh, I do think there was an equal amount of negatives. So what did you see? And I'll kind of go into what I saw in this game. Um, a good offense. It was weird. I didn't expect yeah. that and a bad defense. So, I mean, basically right up front, um, I didn't, no, I don't think anyone had Kyle Manonga going for over 100 yards, let alone 162. Nope. Like, insane production out of him. Maybe he just wanted to show up his former teammate once again in Jalen Berger. <laughs> but, uh, no, he, play, he played really well. Um, Gavin Wimstad actually threw the ball really well. Um, the receiving core, like, showed up a little bit. It was weird. Um, haven't seen them in a while. Um yeah, I mean, like that's pre- that's pretty much it. The offense is gen- in general just was go- was doing well. Like they did pretty well. Yeah, mind you, they only scored twenty one points, um, but that it, it wasn't enough in the end because the defense couldn't hold up. But uh, they they had a really good game, and then the the defense, I, I a lot of question marks there. Um, they did give up some like big run plays. Um, I know Jalen Berger had that one twenty yard plus carry, whatever it was. Um, the other backup running back had like, eleven carries for eighty yards. Like he did pretty well as well as. He did pretty well, too. Jeez, I can't talk. Um, and then for some reason, Jaden Reed keeps going off against Rutgers, and I don't get it. Like, he did this, I think, last year or the year before, and he did it again with 90 yards and a touchdown. Um, the defense was a big-time liability. Yeah, especially early in that game, 13 of Michigan State's first 47 offensive plays went for 10-plus yards, and that was going into the, into the third quarter. So the first two-and-a-half quarters, Rutgers just getting gouged. On the ground, they were getting gouged over the middle. They were getting gouged on the outside. They just really couldn't do anything outside of Michigan State missing wide open guys, which happened a few times in the game. Um, yeah. And Chiano said in his press conference after the game, you know, he doesn't really know what happened, but when guys, especially running backs, are just falling forward through the first series of the game, it's typically yeah. a sign that we're not really filling holes well, we're not being physical enough. And I think that's kind of what we saw because guys were just like getting beat up front. They were just getting. <laughs> Blown off the line, they're having these. They're just kind of getting pushed around, which isn't something I think any of us expected because I thought we matched up pretty well against Michigan State. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it kind of was a bit of a bizarro game because normally it's the opposite. Normally the offense is anemic and the defense kind of keeps us in the game long enough to set up opportunities for the offense to win it for us. But the defense just didn't really do us any favors, especially over the first two to three quarters on uh, Saturday. Yeah, not not a whole lot of pressure up front um, on the defensive line. It, it's a, a little astounding. I know I said it to you before we started recording, but it's amazing how like a guy like Mayan Hanatsu went from like full fledged starter to like doing pretty poor back there. Like they 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 didn't really have much of a pass rush. Like I said, Aaron Lewis did is the only guy that really generated a little bit. And then we hit the quarterback once or twice um, or hurry whatever quarterback hurry. Um, 
then there's just some st- stupid plays. A lot of a lot of stupid, stupid plays. Like the, the Jameer Wright Collins ends up taking the running back and giving him like an extra yard on the one tackle. Yep. Uh, ton of penalties, and it's like, what, what are you what are you doing? Like, I guess you can attribute it to youth, but at the same time, like. I, I don't know how much is really youth. I guess maybe in terms of special teams, you could say that, but everything else, like uh, it, it was just kind of a rough game. And then another missed field goal from Akatami. Um, I, I don't know what to say at that point. And I think that's why we're seeing um, Rutgers looking to kick or something at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Penalties. I mean, Chiano typically is a pretty well-disciplined team in general when he's coaching. Uh, if you talk, if you hear like all the guys who are in the NFL currently from the 1.0 regime of, of Shiano, it seems like a lot of them have lasted as long as they have in the NFL because of these um, these good disciplinary things that Shiano instilled, even if they hated him for it. Um, and yeah, another 14 penalties for 108 yards on Saturday. Rutgers is now 125th out of 131 FBS teams in the number of penalties. They're also the worst in Power 5 in terms of the number, pe- number of penalties on the season. And I also think that, like, there was a lot of co- coaching gaps in this game. I know Shiano's tried to explain away what happened at the end of the first half, but I think what he did was kind of inexcusable. So I get I get the mindset that you're just trying to, like, not put yourself in a bigger hole. And Michigan State was trying to get the ball back. I think there was a minute 50 left. Aaron, Aaron Young on third and 11 runs for 14 yards, gets out of bounds. The clock stops. Rutgers then on first down gets a nine-yard chunk gain. Um, the clock's just continuing to run here. We get that chunk gain, so it's second and one with a minute five left. Shiano lets the clock run all the way down and then calls a timeout, then runs Gavin for a yard, calls another timeout, and then they decide to try and go for it. I just don't get why why you let the time run down from one and you know over a minute to 17 seconds left before you call that timeout to decide to start going for it. There's There's a clear intent to just run the ball, get a first down, kind of salt the game the half away. I get that. That totally makes sense. But once you realize, oh, there's an opportunity to score here, at one minute and five seconds, you go. You don't just run the, let, let the ball, let the clock run down. I just, I get the original intent, but circumstances changed and his thought process didn't change until 17 seconds were left and he called a timeout. I just, I think that's, that's where the, I think that's where a lot of the fans have a problem with it. They don't have a problem with the original intent. They have a problem with what happened after situations changed. Yeah. Um, on, on top of that, I think the other thing that we uh, – that, that, the whole situation, like you just said, was pretty, it was pretty bad. Um, and w- one person I forgot to mention, I guess two people, um, Kobe Asamoah actually played pretty decent. I know yeah. the PFF grades were pretty bad, but um, he, he played decent for his size. I think the IDOA, they still want him to play center. And uh, he might get that chance because we, we even saw Gus Lewinsky's play some significant snaps as well. So, And getting Willie Tyler out of there obviously was the good move. Um, putting J.D. Dorenzo there, for now, temporarily, it's not a bad move. But um, I think Dorenzo is better at guard, but there's no tackle option. So it's you, you don't really know what to do there. I would even considering – I know it's too late in the season to probably even do this, but why not put Pierce at left tackle and put Willie on the right tackle and see what happens. But uh, – yeah, the, the O-line actually played pretty well, too. I mean, the overall, this this offense, I have no complaints. Defense, complaints, coaching, bad, special teams, uh, up and down because Korshak was good, but the kicking game was awful. The penalties, like, it was, the, it was just it was a weird game overall. That's really all you could say about it. The game was there for the taking for Rutgers. Like, it was a close game for the majority of it. Um, we were answering back when, you know, I think there was a couple times where they went up by two scores and we were able to, to cut the lead. Um, we had the opportunity to take the lead at one point. Like, Kyle Manungai, like you said, had a fantastic game. He was physical. He broke a lot of tackles. He really set the tone for the offense on that first carry of the game where he ran over mm-hmm. their, um, you know, yeah. multi-year starting linebacker for, like, Here's a 23-yard crack. gain. Uh, I thought Rashad Rochelle looked great. He had great mm-hmm. contact balance. He, had, he only had two or three touches, but every single one of them, he was just flashing a lot of, a lot of talent. Aaron Young yeah. looks way – like he looks at the best he's ever has as a, as a running back. I thought he looked really good as a receiver as well, even though he only caught one pass. I thought he was running good mm-hmm. routes. Uh, Gavin clearly had his best game as a, as a Scarlet Knight. Um, he looked really comfortable back there on Saturday. He had a much better feel for the game. He was making better decisions. And even the, the times where he made mistakes, like, for example, on the um, on the, uh, the intentional grounding, he made the right decision. It's just he was still barely inside the tackle box. 
because it was set up to be a screen. The screen was covered. There was no second read on that play. So he mm-hmm. scrambled to the right and just chucked it up where nobody could catch it. But he was just barely on the line of being inside the tackle box. So they got called for that. But he had the right he had the right idea of what to do. Like, if it's not there, dirt it. Or it's not there, throw it out of bounds. Yeah. Um, but the defense, man, it just didn't show up. <clears throat> so many missed tackles, penalties, soft coverage, gouge for big plays, mental mistakes. Like, we had, like, two or three 12 men on the field penalties. We got off the field um, on third and seven, but we had a roughing call on Kenny Fletcher that, that mm-hmm. extended a drive. There was a DPI on Aaron Young or Avery Young against yeah. the tight end, which was horse shit. That was a push off by by the tight end. But you just have to be able to get you have to turn your head around. Like refs aren't they're they're people too. And if they don't see you looking for the ball, you're gonna get called for that more often than not. Yeah. Um But it's just we have to stop making these stupid mistakes. And it's and it's you know, players, it's coaches, it's people not knowing the situation. Mm-hmm. And I hope it just has to do with youth because Chiano's teams typically are not ones to commit as many penalties as, as we have this year. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it needs to change moving forward. Yeah, and I know everyone keeps putting the blame on the fact that there's no special teams coordinator. Like, stop. That's not the thing. Like, they still have multiple special teams coaches. They just don't – they just can't recruit. Like, Eddie Allen, like, the guy they hired this offseason has been, like, a special teams coordinator at, like, multiple colleges already. Um, they also have a guy, like a different guy for kicking, a different guy for punting, all that stuff. You, you can't blame it on the fact they don't have a coordinator. Most teams don't have a coordinator anymore because it's a useless position for recruiting. Um, yep. So, I mean, stop blaming it on that. Like, yeah, maybe Shire help, like, would have helped a tiny bit because I think Shire has more experience than uh, the staff they have currently, but that's besides the point. Um, and then on, on top of all that, I didn't even get to talk about the uh, the position switches that are, I guess, permanent now. Like you said, Rashad Rochelle is one. Of them. Yep. He's, a, he's at running back, it seems like, permanently. Or not permanently, for the time being. And Cam Stewart um, is going to be tight end, it looks like, for at least the rest of this season. And then maybe uh, I was told they'll reevaluate it in the offseason and see, see what happens after that. But he might be your blocking tight end now, so who knows? But uh, a lot of position switches. And I don't know if I question it because Gianno's done it so many times in the past, but... You have guys like Chris Long who switch back and forth between receiver and DB. Uh, Max Patterson who switched back and forth between receiver and DB. And uh, you see it more and more. Ireland Brown switched from D tackle to center. Like, I don't think many people saw that one coming either. But uh, a lot of position switches on this team. And so far, so so good in most of them. Yeah, typically it's – you want to see the position switches early in a career, like as a <clears throat> redshirt freshman, just because, like, that means, okay, we gave him a shot. It's not working. And now we – Got to just try something to get this guy in the field before he's kind of processed. Um, the Chris Long, I think he's probably been our second best receiver this year overall because um, Sean Ryan clearly has been the best, but he's still really young. He's still learning a lot. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know if Cam Stewart was really playing a lot on the defensive line, but as a tight end, as just a blocker, I, I don't know. It's, it seems like a weird – transition but he's still young enough that maybe he can learn to be a good receiving threat as well because he get yeah. come in as a pretty good athlete so it is weird just to have like a specific blocking tight end but i mean it's it's not crazy anymore like people are doing it non-stop honestly at this point like if you're Rutgers, do what you did with reggie sutton a couple years ago and put another offensive lineman out there i know after watching the giants this past weekend they had seven lineman sets because uh they don't have enough tight ends and it's like the best option is to put the, put a different uh, tackle out there yeah, it's not it's not the craziest thing in the world, but the issue is is Rutgers doesn't have a, a tackle to begin with. So, yep, um, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, so sticking with football, uh, is there anything else in the game you want to talk about before we kind of move on to other things football related? Um, no, I mean credit to uh, I do want to give a lot of credit to uh, Desmond Igbenosin setting the tone pretty early. Fucking, I flipped the guy completely and just like yeah, stuffed yep. his head in the ground. That was, that was hilarious. <laughs> I know he shared it on Instagram a couple times too, and put like all the like tough guy emojis, like the flexing muscles, and I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, um, there, there's the end of the game stuff, like the stupid snap stuff, but I, I don't, I don't see anything weird wrong with it really. Uh, go for the ball if you can get it, get it. Um, it's not diving at the ankles. I know Shiano mentioned it in his presser today too. It's not diving at anyone. Um, it, it, it's like a typical play. Look what happened to Buffalo yesterday on the goal line. It's a little bit different situation. Yeah. Different scenario, but but he, Chiano, thing, Chiano like, claims that they've they they forced three fumbles in that scenario in the past. I don't remember that ever. I don't recall not on not in not on Rutgers. Yeah, 
And then the only time he did in the league, uh, he almost got in a fight with Belichick. Well, that's Coughlin. Tom Coughlin. Oh, Coughlin, Coughlin. That's what I'm thinking of. Oh, Jesus, yeah, yeah. Giants, too. Like, I should have known that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's – it is what it is. Like I don't, I don't mind it, especially when the game's only one one score game. Go for it. Fuck it. What, what risk comes worse? You just pissed off the other coach. That's about it. Like, so I don't know. Yeah, and it's not like there's a lot of love loss there between him and Mel Tucker. Um, no. Fuck that guy. Yeah, he's he's probably like the only coach that I really, really just hate. Right? Even I don't hate him as much as um, I even hate him more than James Franklin. And James Franklin just kind of I hate because he's like pompous. But Mel Tucker, I hate because he's just a dick. Like, yeah, he's such a weirdo, swinging at fans and shit. Like, what are you doing? Yep. Your team's your team's taking on what you're doing, basically, too, with the other fighting. Like, yep. He just runs a uh, dirty program. We'll say it like that. Yeah, and uh, those things typically catch up with you. Um, yep. But moving on to uh, football-related things, uh, let's talk a little bit about recruiting. So. It was a bit of a surprise decommit this weekend uh, when Dante Barone, he initially announced he was de- decommitting and then took it down and then put it back up again. He's decommitting from Rutgers, going to <laughs> the University of Pennsylvania. And I think this one's like the, the perfect win-win situation where he's going to an Ivy. It sounds like he's a really smart kid. He wants to get into business mm-hmm. school there. And we kind of, I, I, I want to say that this was a Gleason like, slam like bang the fist on the table type kid where he wanted like a a langan like player where it's like an h back for his offense mm-hmm. um it kind of there's not really many guys who play that position in, at the high school level um wh- what are you hearing about this decommit and did it kind of come out of nowhere or is the staff kind of like fine with it happening it's it's kind of like um I'm not gonna bad enough the kid but it, it's more at his level to play at upenn um He's, he's not a Rutgers, a Big Ten kid, in my opinion. And he, he plays a unique position, like you mentioned. He plays that H-back role that's, like, not there anymore. Um, it wasn't really a Gleason thing, per se, but Gleason was okay with, like, adding him, from what I was told. And then, um, obviously, the offense going forward is not going to be – not going to use an H-back anymore, for the most part. Johnny Langan's shifted from running back quarterback to, like, almost like a full-time tight end now, it seems like, for the most part since the new offense is installed. And the fact that, like, they're all talking about how that he wouldn't fit the new offense kind of leads me to believe that Nunzio might be the OC. And I think that they're going to run this offense like like the way it is. Nunzio knows I can't use an H-back guy, so I'm just going to keep going that way. I think that's uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, it wasn't anything crazy. The kid's very smart. Uh, I think his brother, actually, uh, Francisco Barone, actually goes to uh, UPenn or committed to UPenn as well, so... You get to play with his uh, brother, and then you get to also uh, you get the Ivy League education. End of the day, that's, that's all that all that matters. Like he, I think he put in the hashtag forty four for forty or something like that, uh, which means four years for. Which, I can't even talk right now. It's a four year decision for a forty year something. I forget for what four years. The next forty years, you're next forty years. Yeah. Of there we go. Got it. Yeah, <laughs> close. I didn't go to Ivy League. You can tell. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I could, as, as I've gotten like out of, you know, the, the college sphere, like it totally makes sense. Go Ivy, like kids who make these kind of decisions oftentimes are like super mature. It makes sense. Like I would never fault a kid for, for going to an Ivy league school if that's, you know, their thought process. So yeah, I wish him luck. Uh, but it kind of worked out because I, again, don't think he, I also agree that I don't think he was necessarily like a big 10 quality player. So mm-hmm. it all worked out. Um, but you kind of – another, you know, breadcrumb that nuns might be favored for right now for the OC role is that we offered one of his former players in Jack Russell, the quarterback mm-hmm. out of uh, Ramapo. Yeah. What are you hearing about him? Because uh, he's, he's another kid that's currently committed to an Ivy at, at Harvard. Mm-hmm. His season just ended this past week. Do you think he's going to take a visit soon? What are you, what are you hearing about Jack Russell? So it sounds more of like a flip-flop type situation where um, Russell's actually um... – leaning towards going towards Rutgers instead of going to the Ivy League route. Um, he grew up with Nunzio. He was working out with Nunzio when he was younger and before even, I think elementary school it was, or middle school, whenever uh, Quarantano was at Bergen, because Bergen had Quarantano working out, doing workouts with nuns, and then he would join in on those workouts. The Grusser family is just very close with the Campanellis. Um, the younger Grusser brother, Patrick Grusser, is the starting quarterback at DePaul for Nick Campanelli. Um, obviously. Interesting. Obviously, Jack played for Vito. He actually never played for Nuns. Uh, he played for Vito Campanelli, 
he grew up training with Dundio Campanelli and the other brother plays for Nick Campanelli. So it's like the whole Campanelli, like uh, mafia up there. Just running <laughs> stuff. And uh, now it sounds like Jack might be playing for Nunzio as the OC. And it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Now they were showing interest in a couple different quarterbacks, like uh, obviously that we've talked about, but um, in the end, they like Chris are the best. And they, they sent them out to offer uh, his season ended last week. He did get dinged up a little bit. I was told. Uh, towards the end of the game, and it ended up costing them the game for the most part because they did lose by, I think, like a touchdown or maybe less than that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it sounds like he's going to make a decision towards the middle to a later part of this week. It could be pushed back to the next week, but it sounds like a decision has to be made relatively quickly. Um, he did visit campus uh, what was the game for? Uh, Michigan, duh, uh, for the Michigan game, so he was there for that, and that's when he got the offer, and I, I really like Rutgers' chances. If I could submit a future cast for a flip right now, I would, but uh, our technology is outdated in that regard, so we, we can't do that yet. <laughs> um, but I would definitely submit a future cast for Rutgers. I think they land them. You get another Jersey guy, and it adds some depth, which is nice, and you, you need depth at the quarterback. You have one quarterback, scholar, or two scholarship quarterbacks next year right now with Simon, but I do think he probably doesn't return because he could go to the lower level and probably start somewhere. Yeah, that's kind of – I don't know I have any inside information, but it kind of, you know, feels like that vibe where he's going to leave a la Cole Snyder and probably pick up a job, at, like, at a Mac school or maybe at a, a high-level mm -hmm. MCS um, because he's not a bad quarterback, but it's clear that Gavin is the superior player at this point. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned. It sounds like maybe later this week we'll, we'll hear some more about Jack Grusser. Is he Grusser or Grusser? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. I, I've always um, said Grusser, but then you said Grusser, so I was like, oh, Mike must know. Like, I don't know for sure. I like, don't know, sense. so like, right, I guess we'll find out. I'll have to find out. Oh, yeah. Geez, so stay tuned to the boards because that sounds like uh, it's, you know, a news item that will pop this week. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the transfer portal, though, because that's starting to heat up. Um, another Not coach keeping got fired. you doing it right. I know. Uh, you're, another coach got fired recently. Oh, nice. Uh, in Jeff Scott at USF. So we've started to show interest in a couple of those players. Um, and there's also some interesting uh, connection to an FCS quarterback that I wanted to kind of go over with you. So it sounds like there's also a connection with one of the USF players to Rutgers. So tell us a little bit about Xavier Weaver um, and how there's a connection between Rutgers and a really good re receiver from USF. Oh, you put me on the spot here. I forget which high school in Florida he's at, but I think That's it's Osceola. Orlando. So, Orlando. Orlando Christian. Okay. Yes. That, yeah. that, I'm, I'm thinking about the other one, the other quarterback. Yep. Um, yeah, we'll go over that too. So Xavier <laughs> Weaver, um, Orlando Christian Prep, Voy Nakun Jr., um, committed to Rutgers 2023, yeah, 2023 class, also from Orlando Christian Prep. Um, so there's a little connection there. The coach obviously has a pretty, pretty good, strong bond with uh, Demir Shaw. And that's how they got Nakun Jr. in the first place. But now um, it, it sounds like Weaver's going to – did he officially answer the portal? I think so, right? He hasn't, but um, oh, okay. I think it's like a really poorly kept secret that he's going to. Yeah, and obviously um, coaches are starting to follow him all over the place, um, from schools all over. He, he's a very good receiver. But uh, on top of that, the other connection, too, is USF's wide receivers coach. Um, I forget his first name, but his last name is Bentley. Is it yeah, I think it's Bob – Bill Bentley or Bob Bentley? Bell, one, of Bob, one of those Bentleys. But um, if you know anything about Rutgers over the past couple of years, you knew that uh, Bentley is the father of Chase Todd. And yep. therefore, there's your connection right there. So you might be able to snag him as an assistant coach. Bobby Bentley is his name. Um, yep. So maybe pass game coordinator and wide receivers coach. Obviously, Rutgers doesn't need a wide receivers coach at the moment. Um, but maybe you could put him somewhere else. He has coached other positions, I believe, as well. And uh, his previous stops, he's a uh, – He's an interesting one because now if you could get uh, Weaver on campus and then get Bentley, I mean, that's that's two big upgrades right there. Weaver's been pretty good this year, too. Um, he has a couple highlight reel catches that uh, I think you posted on our message board thread. Um, yep. So, I mean, between the Orlando Christian thing, the connection to Chase Dodd's dad, like there, there's no reason why, uh, why he shouldn't be at Rutgers, you would think. Yeah, at the very least, uh, give us a, a – a chance. Um, these guys tend to get, you know, just it's like trying to drink out of a, a fire hose when they a actually enter the portal. Just, just they're reading that story about Miles Frazier last year, how he had like 75 coaches in the first day contact him and trying to, mm -hmm. you know, keep track of all that sounds like a total nightmare. Um, but yeah, one to keep an eye on there. Um, another one I thought was interesting uh, Campbell's 
uh, it's an FCS school. Um, you might recognize it from that kid who was committed to Maryland from Camden, who ended up going FCS instead. He was a four star. who was just clearly uh, a little overrated at the time. Uh, but Chad Masco, he is the backup quarterback there. He had a spot start last week, and he had you know one of the best games of a freshman this past season. He had like 378 yards and three touchdowns in three quarters. And he also has a connection to Rutgers, and his brother is currently committed to Rutgers mm -hmm. out of Osceola High School, uh, Bo Mascow. Uh, are you hearing anything about him, or is that just pure speculation on my part there? It's it's just speculation right now. It's still early. They're not really – I know there's you have to kind of, like, focus on the portal right now, but a lot of people, like, aren't – they're focused on the season. Like, that's the problem yeah. right now. Yeah. That's, like, that's why they like doing stuff like getting all these commits, like, locked in before – uh, before the season even starts, because then that's it gets too hectic to like manage recruiting and then this and then that, and it gets a, it gets a little nuts at times. But um, I, I do think that's a very high possibility that he could end up with Rutgers. I'm not saying anything guaranteed, but if he does enter the portal, I, I think Rutgers would reach out immediately, and it's it's just a depth piece at that point too. Um, now I say that, mind you, because he he was a pretty good quarterback at the high school. I don't know what happened that he ended up decommitting with Florida State when in his recruitment. Um, we did change in, coaches. So I think Willie Taggart was the guy who was coaching when he committed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Norville took over and they basically said that you're not what we're looking for. And he entered back into the market. Yeah, it's a little weird, though, still. Uh, if you're, you go from four star Florida State commit to um, Campbell, like backup quarterback, like some, something had to happen. And um, I know he did suffer a couple injuries in high school. I don't know when exactly they happened, but um, on top of that, he's. He's a pretty good. He's not tall either. He's six one, two ten. Like, I think that's part of the problem. Is he was yeah. like six feet tall as a freshman. He had this crazy good year in Georgia. Then he goes to IMG, tears his meniscus as a sophomore, and then ends up going back home to Osceola. And he just didn't really grow <clears throat> after his freshman year. So as mm -hmm. a six one senior, you know, with injury history, you can kind yeah. of see it, I guess. It's 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 a tough one, and you know these numbers are always inflated. He's probably not six one. He's probably more like five eleven or five ten or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he just put up some crazy. I'm, it's Campbell's not the Big Ten, but he did just have a yep. crazy good game coming in as a backup as a true freshman. So, if he was to enter, I mean, why not reach out? It can't hurt. Um, then you have a then you kind of talking about a nice little quarterback room. Then maybe like you have a Grucer, Gavin, uh, maybe Simon Still, and then Mascow like. Even if Simon leaves, that's still a pretty good, like, one, two, three, I would say. Yeah, um, and most of these are just kind of like we're reading the breadcrumbs here. And I think a lot more is going to happen in the next two weeks in the portal, given that, you know, season's two weeks away from finishing. Mm -hmm. So definitely keep on the boards regarding that. Because um, we'll have, I'm sure, entire episodes to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I did want to mention real quick before we move on from the portal stuff. Like, I, I know you saw the tweet on with that uh, one of the national recruiting analysts put out, but everyone's cheating right now. Like, it's just yep. like if you're not getting a big time transfer, unless you're reaching out to the kid already before he even yep. enters the portal. Like, everyone's tampering with each other. I can tell you for a fact, and I said this on the boards, like, people have reached out to Rutgers players. Like, everyone is tampering. Like, it's, they, there's, it's a wild, wild west. This offseason is going to be absolutely insane. It's going to be a shit show. And I'm kind of excited for it. Yeah, last year I thought was pretty wild. But this year I think will be orders of magnitude more crazy. Yeah, like because now that, it's like that saying, window. You have, like, the three-week span. They're like, go, 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 go. Like, half these guys are going to enter the portal, and it's like, Dude, I could have put a future cast in a month ago where he was going. Like, it's, it's insane. Yeah. And I think there's so much less stigma about changing schools now. If you look at, like, some of the, the mock drafts that are coming out, like, a third of those guys were in the portal a year or two ago. Like, yeah. a guy like Jared Verse, even from Albany, who, you know, everybody wanted ended up at Florida State. He's probably going to be a top 10 pick now because you can just, he just jumped out on tape at mm -hmm. Albany. And some guys are playing at the lower level. And I know we kind of get it. You know, some people are like, why is he playing at this school if he's so good? It's like, well, either he grew a ton, either he went to a high school who didn't have a ton of, you know, visibility. He could have been playing basketball until he was junior and just picked up football. Yeah. Like, there's so many reasons why a guy might be under-recruited that I don't, I don't think it's fair to be like, any guy at a lower level can't play at an upper level. I think if he's dominating mm -hmm. at a lower level, there's a chance he could be really good at an upper level. If he's doing yeah. nothing at the lower level, he's probably going to do less than nothing at a higher level. Um, yeah, but 
That, that's pretty factual. I mean, look, Will Levis is probably QB three in the draft. And he's a transfer. Yeah. Jesus. Oh, just knocked that over. Um, yeah, he's he's a, he's a transfer portal kid who wasn't even seeing the field at Penn State, and now he's a QB three. Like, what I'm, the hell? I'm sure Penn State's are dealing with that rationally too. Um, but we'll talk oh, yeah. we'll talk more about Penn State later this week, given that yeah. you know we have a unique uh, situation with Richie covering both teams. Um, the answer's full. Jeez. <laughs> all right, we're good. We're good. Sorry. It's all good. Um, so yeah, more to come on the transfer portal in future episodes and on the board. Just it's kind of a rapidly evolving thing. Things change mm-hmm. every day. Yeah. New new follows happen every day. So stick yeah. to the boards and everything for that. Um, let's talk basketball though. Uh, since our last pod, Rutgers has played two basketball games. We previewed game two in the last pod. Rutgers ended up winning that game, eighty-eight to fifty. Um, and then they played a game against UMass Lowell on Saturday. Uh, I think they won by eight. Um, yeah. They won eight, 73 to 65. Tell me a little bit about what you've seen from this team this year through three games, what's encouraging, and what we need to work on. Um, Cliff, double-double machine. I think we kind of knew that already. Uh, but he's starting to get better. Um, any, he's starting to expand his range a little bit. Like, yeah, he's hitting – He's probably taking a, little, a couple too many. Like He's getting too comfortable with the three-point line because now he's just chucking them. Uh, they're not going in, per se, but he is uh, starting to expand his range from beyond that uh, half cylinder to a little bit further, like almost free throw line area. Um, he, there was one play uh, where he was against UMass, and he, he went up. He missed like a stupid like little throw-in, and he just grabbed a crazy rebound and slammed it home from like – with like three defenders in front of him in the paint. And it, it was absolutely insane. So Cliff is Cliff. Like there's, there's no way around it. He's been phenomenal. Um, Cam had a really good game. Uh, he, he basically carried the team on offense other than Cliff's 22. Uh, Hyatt, Hyatt showed up. It was weird. I never saw that. <laughs> yeah. Hyatt's been a revelation this year. I think he's played so well, uh, much yeah. better than I thought he, he could honestly. Yeah, so that that's huge for Rutgers because now you get another piece that a guy that's like has experience, number one, a former four star, and a guy that could shoot from at will at times. Like maybe he didn't shoot great numbers. I think he was I'm looking now, three of ten and two of six from three. But he did get twelve points and six rebounds, and he's a great rebounding guard. I know people are like guard. Like, no, he he's a guard. Pykel's called him a guard before. Um he's just a tall, lengthy six, 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 seven guard. Um Mag didn't do too well in the game. I think he went like one of seven and oh of two for three, but he does well on the defensive end and that's that's what counts. He might not show up in the box score as much. He did have two steals, so that showed up, but overall his defensive effort doesn't show up, but he he played really well. Um you lost Paul too, which which kind of sucked. Yeah, he had to, it looked like his shoulders just straight up popped out. Um yeah. He, yeah, he, he did come back to the bench, so I think he, I think he could have went back in if they needed him necessarily, but, like, this this team's deep, so I don't really think you needed them. Um, yep. Like, Derek Simpson, <laughs> Derek Simpson played 34 minutes. That's the second most on the team. Like, it was crazy. Yes. He, and he played great minutes, like 10 of 10 from the free throw line. That's what won you the game. I hate to say it. Between the 8 of 8 from Spencer, 6 of 8 from Cliff, 10 of 10 from Simpson, that won you the game, the 82% from the line. And we haven't seen that in years, maybe ever under Michael. Yeah, I think it kind of demonstrates that we have a lot of versatility this year. Like, obviously, the team wasn't shooting well on Saturday. They, you know, went three for 16 from three. They went 21 for 62 from the field. But they went 28 for 34 from the line. Like, they show that they can win in multiple different ways. Like, this mm-hmm. game was a cliff game where he was just getting a ton of rebounds. They were feeding him in the paint. He played its most minutes of the season so far. Um I do think they need to clean up around the rim. They miss a lot of shots, you know, within three feet of the paint or three feet of the cylinder. Um, and it's just about slowing it down. They're just kind of turning and chucking uh, back at the rim sometimes. Um, and Cliff, you know, he could do that two or three times to get his own rebound. But, you know, a guy like like Wolfel, he, he kind of needs to clean that up. Um, Derek Simpson needs to clean that up. Watt Mag needs to clean that up. Um, but defensively, I think everybody on the team is making an impact on defense. Like, mm-hmm. our team is collectively so long that we close passing lanes, and it's so hard for teams to, to initiate anything on the interior because everybody's just throwing an arm in there, going for loose balls, just playing, like, really, really well defensively as a team. And that's despite Caleb not being back. And I can only imagine how much better this defense is going to be when he comes back. Yeah. Uh, I know, like, 
people want to talk a little negative about the game because it was a UMass Lowell team and it was like their first test, but they're not a bad team. They, they're a senior no. team. They got a couple of nice transfers. They have a LaSalle guard who, who obviously played pretty well. And then their big man, their big man's no joke. He signed with Pitt out of high school. Like he was, he was pretty good. Like he had, like, I think I'm looking now, he had 18 high major offers. Like it's not like he's some nobody. Like he was pretty good out of a uh, Scotland performance Institute in Pennsylvania, but like, uh, it's not like it's a no name. So they did rebound really well. I think that team's actually going to win a lot of games in that league. Uh, they, they oh, only out rebounded them by one. It was 43, 43, yep. two. Like, just a ton of missed shots, like you said, too. So that's where the rebounding opportunities are coming from. Um, I do think someone, uh, Wolfolk, didn't play bad, but I do wish he was just learning. He, I guess he's still learning, too. Like, you got to remember, this guy was a football player last year. He wasn't even yep. playing hoops. Um, so, I mean, he's starting to learn, but I think it's he's solidified himself as a backup five. And I think Reaper's kind of lost his role. I know there's a lot of hype from some people and certain beat writers, but, like, he, he doesn't really have a role anymore. Like, he's going to be, like, the reserve big man. Um, but overall, like like you said, the shooting was porous. This this is basically – this was their Lafayette this year, I think, in my opinion. I think that this was just a poor shooting performance, but they found a way. They grinded it out, played good defense in the end, and hit their free throws, and that's what the difference maker is. They don't hit those free throws. This is Lafayette 2.0. Yep, but Instead, absolutely. now it's a, it's a Rutgers win. This is a game they probably don't win most of the time. In the past couple seasons, but this year they did it. They won, and you, you hopefully you get Paul back uh, this week, and then you get uh, Caleb back relatively soon. I don't know if it'll be this week. It sounded like it might be a little bit later, but either way, once those two are healthy, I think this, the sky's the limit for this team. No, I agree, uh, but this is going to be the toughest test of the season so far by far on Friday. They play at Mohegan Sun against Temple. Temple had a huge win <laughs> this past week against uh, one of their biggest rivals in Villanova. The first time they beat Villanova in 10 years. Yeah, so I mm-hmm. was criticizing uh, them on Twitter. I don't know who that was. I know. You got a lot of shit from uh, Temple fans, and I'm sure that they're just waiting to fire back at you. Fans. I know. Shit. I was shocked. I had like six replies. I was like, whoa, he does exist. Yeah, Temple's up to 97th in Ken Palm now. Rutgers is up to uh, 43rd. I think they started the season at 50th. Yes. So Rutgers has been moving up a little bit. I think they were at 39th prior to the UMass Lowell game. UMass Lowell is uh, 145th in Ken Palm. So they're no slouch. Temple is going to be a tough game. They've got two really good scorers. Um, I'll I'll look up their names now because I don't have them off the top of my head. It's it's Khalif Battle and Damian Dunn. I, I know I've seen Khalif quite a bit out of high school. Uh, he played over at St. Joe's Metuchen, and obviously, like growing up, when you see like Carl and Wade, and then you're like, "Oh wow, who's next?" And then the next class, yeah, you know, it's just like a Khalif battle, and that was pretty much it. Um, well, Khalif battle, he was, he's a Jersey kid, right? Yeah, St. Joe's Metuchen. Okay, so yeah, I got to I got to watch him actually out of high school quite a bit. Um, or am I thinking? Am I thinking Khalif, or am I thinking Tyus? I might be thinking Tyus battle. I might be wrong completely. I'm pretty sure Khalif played there too, but. Regardless, uh, he, he's going off. Uh, yeah, I was wrong. I'm, I'm thinking of the older brother, Tyus Battle. But uh, it's Tyus went to Syracuse, right? And yes. police went to. He started at Butler, which was the ultimate like what? And then like he ended that. up at Temple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. He's been playing really well though so far this year, and he kind of just picked up uh, where he was last year before he got uh, injured. I think he got injured last year, right? Yeah, he did. He only played in. So he hasn't played much at all at Temple. So mm-hmm. last year he played in seven games. He started all seven. Uh, 2020, 21, he, he started uh, four games, played an 11 overall. But he's averaged 15-plus points a game in every season that he's been at Temple. It's just, you know, staying on the court. Um, yeah. Against Villanova, he played really well. Uh, he had 21 points. Uh, it looks like he's basically only a scorer, though, because he's got one assist through two games, and that's in yes. 68 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you could well, just lock him. Seems- Sorry, go on. No, I, if you just lock him up, it doesn't seem like he's really got the outs to kind of make a play happen if he's not scoring. So that's the thing, too, with Damien Dunn. Like, he's the same exact way. He just scores. He's not really a, a passer much. Um, and he's actually taking his game to a completely new level. Like, he, he went from averaging, like, 14 to 25 this year. Um, and mind, mind yep. you, they did get that win against Villanova, but they, they also have a loss against Wagner. Like, yep. it's, uh, it's a very weird season for this team. Um, they, they're in, like, a weird limbo. Area, I guess. Uh, they and they went to overtime away there too. Like that's that's a horrible yep. start. But what a what a bounce back to beat Villanova. And then um, it, Rutgers are going to have their hands full. I think we'll see a lot of Jalen Miller. I think Derek Simpson is going to play the majority of the minutes as uh, pending Mulcahy's injury health or health status. 
Um, even with like Paul healthy, I, I don't think you put Paul on either of these guys. Like I think it's going to be tough for Paul to guard these guys. And then um, fans are familiar with uh, the rest of the lineup too. And Zach Hicks was a Rutgers target for a long time at a Camden Catholic. He really wanted the Rutgers offer badly and probably would have went if Rutgers did offer. Ended up at Temple and, and he's, he's been pretty well too. Um, this, this, is a, this is an interesting game. This is going to be the first test for these guys. And if you're not fully healthy, it's even an even bigger test then. So now it's it's going to get interesting. you got to win this one. Um, and uh, the Mohegan Sun thing, um, I could go on a rant about that if I wanted to, but it's the stupidest fucking thing in the world. Like, just play an AC if you're going to do, like, a casino or yep. something. Um, or just, well, I think the problem know. with that is it was it was a game, that, and you know this, but I'll just kind of lay out some of the details. It was a game that was yeah. agreed upon that had a different opponent. That opponent backed out, and Notre Temple Dame. filled in. Notre Dame. Uh, yeah. 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 Notre Dame was supposed to play Rutgers in that game. I don't know what happened, but they backed out. And then Rutgers was trying to, I guess, keep its commitment to the game. And uh, Temple was willing to, to come up and play. Yeah. The, the almost This uh, whole schedule is just filled with almost. You almost had Gonzaga at one point. You almost yep. had Notre Dame again at one point. Like, it's a lot, of, a lot of almost here. Like College basketball schedules are weird, and they just change constantly. Like it's, it is what it is. Yeah, no, it's 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 not easy to do. And um, – like, uh, I think a lot, I think he had, I think he's even talked about this, how he was, uh, every, every coach in America would answer his call when he started the job. And now not so yep. much. Nobody, <laughs> nobody's really given him any calls back anymore because nobody wants to play at the rack. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you can get those by games, but you're just, he, he was talking about, you know, Wake Forest is one of the only teams that was interested in doing a home and home. So mm -hmm. that's why they're on the schedule this year. Um, yeah, that's a weird one. So T Temple, like we were kind of alluding to, they're not there. There are a bunch of just scorers on that team, so they're only averaging eight and a half assists per game as a team. And kind of to compare, Rutgers is averaging over fifteen assists per game, so almost twice as many mm -hmm. assists. They're not a great defensive team. Like Rutgers averages almost fourteen steals a game, which is a number you're not going to see keep up. But Temple averages five and a half. Um, so I think Rutgers does have an advantage here. Just you know, as long as we could lock down their two main scorers, Damian Dunn and Khalif Battle, which is obviously easier said than done. But I do think Rutgers should win this game um, at uh, Mohegan Sun. Yeah, and they're also really low in rebounding. You're only getting 33 rebounds a game. You got a guy like Cliff down low and a, a, a couple guys like um, like Battle, like Matt, or Battle, like uh, Hyatt, like Mag, like Caleb if healthy. Even Paul's a pretty good rebounder. Cam's even a really good rebounder. Like, they should be able to out-rebound this team big time, and that's going to pay off huge in terms of uh, transition buckets, in terms of just to even offensive rebounds. Like, I think Cliff's almost averaging five offensive rebounds a game. Like, Mind you, some of these guys aren't great that they're going against, but like like I mentioned before, the pick guy is pretty good, and he, he out-rebounded him pretty well. Um, so, I mean, yeah, this this team should uh, – this is going to be a test. It's going to be interesting. Like I mentioned before, I think maybe you uh, – you might have to see a lot of Simpson, a lot of Miller, a lot of Cam. Um, I hope, I, ideally, you would get Caleb back, but that sucks. That you probably, probably won't happen. I'm not saying anything's definite there. But, um, yeah, I think you're going to have to use Miller quite a bit in order to guard these guards. They're, they're quick. They are quick and crafty. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we saw last week um, Gavin Griffiths signed his, L his uh, LOI on Wednesday, I believe, on the first – I believe that was the first day of uh, the, the yes. early signing period for basketball. Mm -hmm. That early signing period ends this Wednesday, the 16th, um, and we're, we've been waiting on a few big men from, for Rutgers between Bay Fall, between mm -hmm. uh, – uh, his last name's Chinyelu, um and <laughs> Dembele. Uh, there's – Three guys we're waiting on. It doesn't seem like we're going to get Bayfall. The guy Chinyelu committed to Washington State today. And the last mm -hmm. guy in that kind of trio of guys we're looking at is a player of the last name of Dembele. What are you hearing about him looking as he's the only real legit target left for Rutgers uh, in this early signing period? Yes, yeah, so obviously Chinyelu, they, they actually thought they, were, they were had a pretty good shot at. Um, I alluded to it on the boards. Washington State was right there. Tennessee was, was there but kind of out in the end. Um, he was a Tennessee lean originally, but um, started taking visits, and that was it. Big connection to uh, Wazoo over there from the NBA Global Academy, um, so it makes sense why he ended up doing it um, or committing to there and signing with them. 
But uh, in terms of Dembele, uh, it's, it's Rutgers, Iowa right now. It's, it's, it's a face off between two Big Ten programs. Um, St. Benedict's kid, late bloomer, was playing behind a couple guys in the AAU circuit in terms of like, I think he was behind Pop Conte actually um, with the New York Rens. Uh, so it, it is interesting. He has developed quite a bit over the past year. They said he was a guard growing up. So he's still trying to learn the big man role that he's kind of in now. He's like that six, eight, six, nine types uh, type of role. So he's kind of the complete opposite of Wolfolk. So it would give the Rutgers a different option as a big man uh, for probably for next year. And then obviously beyond that, but uh Right now, it's Rutgers, Iowa. Iowa's the favorite. They've been the favorite for quite some time. But Rutgers is pushing pretty heavily for this. They obviously need a big man. I keep calling him a big man, but he's really not a big man. I guess he's more like a four, kind of. But, uh, yeah, Rutgers is trying to get him, uh, push, pushing, putting all, pulling out the red carpet, doing everything they can to grant him. Um, he's, he's kind of the only target for them at the moment. I think they're going to take some time after uh, the signing day wraps up and – Depending on if they can land in Belly or not, uh, they'll just they'll just refocus on big men because you need a big man next uh, next class big time because uh, if Cliff if it keeps playing at this level, Cliff won't be here next year. Yep. And I think that while that would suck, it would make sense, and it would ultimately be a good thing for recruiting if, if, you know, he ends up going to the NBA and, you know, especially if he's a first-round pick. I also think something we're, that's not really talked about a lot is I think Pike will be able to recruit a big man from the portal pretty easily if Pike if mm -hmm. uh, if Cliff did leave and it would it would allow the, the younger guys to really develop even more like there was some guy from was it Lafayette the big the, the center from Lafayette who yes. he probably could have had yeah who ended up at Richmond mainly because it's like well you guys have a center and he's probably going to play um, I don't really want to play backup so mm -hmm. yeah that's why he didn't end up here. Uh, so Pike will be able to land a guy, and I, I think he'll be able to land a guy that's actually really good. Um, so I'm not really worried about big man recruiting right now if we don't land any of these three kids, even though, like you said, uh, Dembele isn't necessarily a, a traditional big like Cliff. He's more of like mm -hmm. a, a, a four. But well, I mean, also the thing is, like, Dembele, no one knew who he was, like, a month ago, two months ago. Like, he came out of nowhere, kind of, and just, like, everyone's like, who the heck's that guy? And uh, he, he's pretty good. Let's watch him. Let's see what happens with him. And you got to don't don't forget they still have Bodo over in uh, California from the uh, SoCal Academy, who they did offer. Mm -hmm. And he's probably the only big man left that um, hasn't committed anywhere, I believe. But um, so you keep an eye out for him. He's actually been developing nicely. He was like one of those late minute additions to uh, the Pangos uh, Open or Pangos, uh, whatever it is, the, uh, one of the biggest like tournaments like for open runs for basketball every year in high school. Um, so that, that's going to be something to watch as well. Uh, he could be a name um, looking right now. There's not, I guess there is a couple, uh, but he plays with some big names. He plays with Isaiah Miranda, who's a five-star. Obviously, Rutgers isn't going to get Isaiah Miranda, but, uh, but um, he does play for some big names. And he, he's another guy who was, he was backing up a couple dudes. I know we posted an article on him not too long ago, and he was backing up like a guy who went to Arizona State, a guy that went to, uh, who was it, uh, Colorado, a guy that went somewhere else. So it's like these guys are starting to emerge by like just playing. Like so I'm I'm very confident Pike will uh will find someone. Obviously he's he found Wolfolk in the middle of nowhere as a football player. Um he, he found uh Dean Reber in the middle of North Carolina just, just shooting pretty much. Like I, I don't know. Like you, you just find these big men out of nowhere and uh that's kind of been the story. No one knew who Chinello was, no one knew who Dembele was. Now no one knows who the next center is gonna be. Who knows? And maybe it's maybe it's Dembele. But um yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see what happens there. That's He's going to decide tomorrow. So uh, I don't know what time exactly, but he he did post on Instagram today. He's deciding tomorrow. I still think it's an Iowa lean, but Rutgers is pushing in that one. Yeah, so stay tuned to the boards for that because uh, it sounds like that one's going to wrap up soon and Rutgers might be, uh, you know, the dark horse here. But we've seen Pike have these crazy last-minute wins in recruiting before, whether it be Montez Mathis, whether it be Cliff Omarui. Uh, he's Pike's never out of it. Uh, he's made yeah. that pretty clear. Even when it, you know, it looked like Montez was a clear UConn lean. We ended up getting him at the eleventh hour. Looked like Cliff was an Arizona State lean. We got him at the eleventh hour. Mm -hmm. So never count Pike out. Um, yeah. Anything else basketball wise you wanted to hit on before we talk a little bit about something else? Um, no, I mean I did my complaining about the game already, um, and then you're gonna have football <laughs> right after. It's like I don't know how many fans are really gonna show up to Mohegan Sun. Um, on a Friday night and football the next day. Obviously, football's at 3.30, so that kind of helps. But, uh, yeah. I'm the worst part sure. is that Mohegan Sun game's at 5 p.m. 
yeah, so you're, you're kind of screwed. You kind of almost have to stay overnight. Like, you're not really a choice. But I guess you could drive home at, like, 7.30, 8 o'clock. But it's just, like, to do all that in one day is miserable. Just don't do it. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I, you you mentioned this, but that game at Boardwalk Hall in AC would probably be a sellout. Insane. That, they should do that. I don't know why there isn't, like, a, a holiday tournament down there. Because that, I mean, it would just be, like, the perfect, you know, little vacation for a lot of Rutgers fans. It's easy to get to. Yeah. Tons of hotels. It's pretty cheap. And uh, even do Wells Fargo. I'll give I'll give Temple the home game, like, pretty much. Go mm-hmm. to Wells Fargo. I, I'll be, and I went there the other day for a Knicks game versus Sixers. I'm not happy I went to that, but I got dragged from it. <laughs> um, that arena is fucking beautiful. Holy yeah, shit. really nice. Like, like it makes, and Barclays is newer, and it makes Barclays look like dog shit. And then MSG I do like because it's, like, old nostalgia and all that. But uh, mm-hmm. it's still, it's it, Wells Fargo blows both those arenas lo- away. Like in terms of like accessibility, food court, this, that. I'm like, holy shit, this place is beautiful. It's funny you say that because a lot of Sixers and Flyers fans aren't happy with Wells Fargo. And there's talks about, you know, a new stadium every couple of years. Um, well, go to a Nets or Knicks game then and just tell me you don't like Wells Fargo. That place is, and I, I'm not, I hate Philly for the most part. I hate Philly sports. That place is great. And that whole setup they have there with Xfinity right in the middle is just like you can't you can't do much better. Yeah, no, uh, that whole setup is like you said, really nice. Where you have just all the all the stadiums catty cornered to one another with like a really nice like center like it's it's almost like a mini mall of bars in like the center of everything. It's uh the Xfinity Live, and they just put a uh, they got a hotel casino there too. So yeah, it's sick. The whole thing is a sick setup. All right, so the last thing I wanted to hit on before we sign off today is I wanted to send a big congratulations to Coach Mc, uh, Mc, I don't know, I mess up his name every time. McElderry and the men's soccer team who has won the first Big Ten team title for the men's sports uh, while in at Rutgers. So big shout out there because that's huge. Um, Rutgers was the two seed in the tournament, and they ended up winning at home at your sack on Sunday. Uh, I don't know if you saw the draw of the NCAA tournament. Uh, Indiana ended up being the 13th overall seed in the field, and mm-hmm. Rutgers ended up being an 11 seed. So they got to play on the road, and then they got to go up to Syracuse if they if they beat the sixth seed and play the three seed in Syracuse. So yeah, uh, they said not it's the all, best draw for them. It's all RPI reasons, which honestly yep. every Rutgers sport for some reason apparently they're out of conference games are just awful. <laughs> But yeah. I think that also has to do with a little bit of the local stuff too, because like none of there's no good local like program to play. Like the Rutgers basketball is playing Ryder. Like they're not good, but they're local. Wagner's a lot good, but they're local. There's not really yep. any good local programs, and it's like eh, there are like anyway, Temple's good, Villanova's good, yeah. St. John's is good. Like there's yes, teams, exactly. but it's yeah. like you you don't want like, you need to lose. yeah you want to play some you know games that get the team warmed up. I I do think you have a point with like soccer and baseball specifically and. That, both yeah. of those teams dealt with a lot of RPI issues. There's not many good teams in the Northeast that play like outdoor year round sports. So yeah, it's, it's tough. Yeah. Unless and you want to travel to Florida or California or Texas for a lot of these games. Yeah. That's where it gets really tough, but that's what the baseball team does. They go to Hawaii and Florida and North Carolina and all that. And I guess it works a little bit, but it's at the same time, you gotta, you gotta win those games. You gotta win the ones you're supposed to and sneak a couple. And that's, that's how you get a better seed. I don't know what to tell you. Definitely, but they're they're in the tournament with the AQ bid, and you know we'll see how they do. Uh, but huge because I think it's the first time in seven years they made the NCAA tournament, and this mm-hmm. is a team that's typically had a lot of success in the past at Rutgers. Yeah. Uh, so big shout out there. Is there anything else you wanted to hit on? We hit on a lot uh, before we sign off. Anything you wanted to, to talk more about? Not that I can think of. Uh, I mean, obviously we'll do a preview pod um, later this week. It'll probably be like a Penn State slash Temple preview, so we'll do the whole Pen- Pennsylvania preview. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, nothing really else going on. Waiting to see on Dembele tomorrow. And uh, Transfer Portal stuff is always uh, updated every day. Uh, there's an article with the, the pro player profiles. You obviously put in a lot of work in terms of uh, highlights and stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's really it. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in once again. I know this is a long episode, but I hope you enjoyed it because we did cover a lot. Um, and stay tuned to the boards and stay tuned to your podcast feed because we'll have another episode out this week. And if there's a, a commitment, we'll have an instant reaction for you there too. Yep. So uh, for me and Richie, this has been another edition of the Nightport Podcast signing off.